up the stage because she's off to a wedding this afternoon. My talk is called How to Make Loveliness because not many people know this, but that is what HTML actually stands for. <laughs> How to Make Loveliness. Any good? Yes. Groovy. Here we go. How to make loveliness with me, Bruce Lawson, and HTML5. Seems like the slides are cut off, but I'll put them on web as soon as I get off stage today. Um, the subtitle is the HTML treasure hunt, because there are all kinds of hidden treasures in HTML. Yeah, I'm Bruce Lawson, and I am an HTML alcoholic. Uh, this is actually a brand of clothing in Tokyo. So when I was in Tokyo a few years ago and I found myself in this department store, of course I had to embarrass myself by reclining on the floor. Um, but HTML is full of buried treasure. But you have to look for it. Once you've found it, there are untold wealth and riches awaiting you. Unfortunately, not necessarily the financial riches, unless you are Hayden Pickering, the author of a best-selling book. Uh, the treasure you will get is your websites will be more performant, they will be more accessible, and for those who don't know, I'm meaning a specific meaning of the word accessible, in that they can be consumed by people with disabilities, uh, including blind people, but not limited to blind people. Your websites will be more robust, they will break less, and therefore people will be able to do whatever they do more easily on your site. There will be less code to write, and this is a good thing because if you have less code to write, you can test less and therefore you get more time in the pub, playing Call of Duty, mucking around with your kids, whatever it is that you like to do in your time off. Because it is every developer's God-given right to be in the pub by 5.30 on a Friday, and nobody can take that away from us except for people who don't appreciate HTML. So, today is a treasure map. We're going to look at how to get these riches. First is use HTML properly. This is not trivial. And then write more HTML. Use CSS properly. And remember that built-in beats bolt-on bigly. If something is given to you for free in the browser, because it's given to you free in the language, you're a fool and a muppet if you don't use that. Quote. I'm not afraid of your modern libraries. I was in Bucharest last year and I saw this graffiti saying, React, run. But I'm not terrified of React or Angular. Those things, React and Angular, are great things, they are tools. Yes, they are big, well-known tools, but <laughs> they are just tools. So, if you want to use React and Angular, Bonestrap, Hubpack.js in your projects, go for it. Knock yourself out. Enjoy yourself. Remember that you're going to have to learn something different next Wednesday week. But use these things, but remember they are tools, they are means to an end and not the end itself. <clears throat> Talking of tools, who likes furniture? Good, because you're going to be burning it for fuel after Brexit. <laughs> so, I'm not at all interested in furniture or woodworking, but I am interested in over-laboring a metaphor. So, here goes. This is the Bible of furniture making. Since its first publication in 1970, the technique of furniture making has established itself as the Bible for all woodworkers. The introduction says, any textbook concerned with the techniques of furniture making must deal primarily with the basic handicrafts, for it is upon this groundwork that machine production is built. And all a machine can ever do is translate the essential hand operation into rotary movements of the cutting tool. For those who really like their metaphors spelled out, if you're going to use React and Angular, etc., these are the machine production. But they're only, as ever, only ever as good as your knowledge of the raw materials. 
Anyone who has only been shown how to force a piece of wood against a mechanised saw will have learnt very little. But if he or she has had to saw that piece of wood by hand, he'll be more likely to know that much more about it, he'll have greater respect for it, and will understand in greater depth the problems that will have to be faced in its manipulation. So the first 150 pages <coughs> of this book do not mention furniture making at all. There are charts like this of the comparative movements in various levels of humidity of different types of wood. There are diagrams showing which cuts of which kind of wood are the strongest. There are in, uh, close-up pictures of the grains of different kinds of wood that you must use. In short, the first hundred or so pages of this book about furniture making are not about making furniture at all, they're about the raw materials. <clears throat> I'm off to Japan later today, uh, not to meet Mr. Toshio Adate, but he wrote this book about Japanese woodworking tools, and he said something which I'd consider deeply profound. The Japanese word shakunin is defined by both Japanese and Japanese English dictionaries as craftsman or artisan, but such a literal description does not fully express the deeper meaning. Shakunin means not only having technical skill, but implies an attitude or social consciousness, a social obligation to work his best for the general welfare of the people, an obligation both material and spiritual. And I think if you can think of woodworking like this, you can think of making the web like this, and you should think of making the web in this way. This bloke is Sir Uncle Timbo. He invented the web. I can call him Sir Uncle Timbo because he asked me to sign a copy of my HTML5 book. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He had no fucking idea who I am. I just said, I'll <laughs> have this book, and he said, I'll sign it then, before he threw it in the bin. But anyway, so Uncle Timbo said, this is for everyone, when he opened the Olympics in 2012. And he really meant it. This is the first ever website that Sir Uncle Timbo made, and here's me mucking about with it in uh, Chrome, as you can see. It's fully responsive. As you can see, I can tab through it, and as I tab through, the links are highlighted, and when I press enter or the space bar, it goes to that destination. The web was fully responsive and fully accessible right from its very conception, but we, we, I'm including myself in this, but primarily blaming you because I'm always up for, uh, for self-extirpation. We broke it. We broke it in many ways. We decided that we would have fixed-width websites. We decided we would have terrible contrast with grey fonts on white background. We decided that we wanted pixel-perfect layouts. We decided to have videos without captions. We decided deliberately that we would break keyboard accessibility because you have to work hard to do this. We decided we'd remove the focus indicator so people who use the keyboard have no idea where they are in a page. You can do this easily. Uh, star, outline, none, and there you are. You've demonstrated how evil you are in one line of CSS. And we did this because we did not have enough respect for the raw materials of the web. And the raw materials are JavaScript, HTML5, and CSS3 as shown by these three handsome geezers. This is Brendan Eich, who invented JavaScript. This is me, not Sir Uncle Timbo, because he's, he's, not, he's not taking the picture I'm lying. He wasn't there. But I invented the picture element, so I kind of count. And this is how come William Lee, who invented CSS. And look, we're having a beer together and smiling. We are not fighting. <laughs> OK, it did kick off after about seven pints. but. No, but seriously, there's so many people who put JavaScript and CSS or JavaScript and HTML in contention with each other, but they're not. They are the three pillars of the web, happily having a beer in the delightful surroundings of Mobile World Congress Barcelona. Have you ever been? Don't. Recently, I read this. I removed the person's name because I don't want to shame him or her. 
It's not this person's wrong. It's a, sim it's a symptom of a wide and deep malaise in our industry. Ten things to learn for becoming a solid, full-stack JavaScript developer. The top four have a fundamental understanding of JavaScript. Okay, fair enough. Of course, you can't do full-stack JavaScript development or full-stack any web development, for that matter, without learning JavaScript itself. Yes, you can. Then the second thing you need to learn is a front-end framework, Angular, React, Ember, one of these things. Then you need to learn Bootstrap 4. <laughs> oh, and HTML, CSS. As for HTML, there's not much to learn right away, and you can kind of learn as you go. But before making your first templates, know the difference between inline elements like span and how they differ from block ones like div. This will save you a huge amount of headache when fiddling with your CSS code. Have you noticed that these people, they're hacking on something, but when they're talking about CSS, they're fiddling with. This kind of disparagement or demeaning of the basic tools, raw materials of our work is gonna kill our industry. So let us look at the wood. Let us look at the raw materials. I'm sure the fact that you people have all got out of bed uh, on a Saturday to come and listen to an old fart like me means that I'm probably telling you stuff you already know. But for those of you on the live stream or YouTube, watch, listen. HTML is declarative. You just say, let there be a button, and lo, there is a button. You don't care how that back button comes to be. <coughs> you don't care that the browser has to know it can be focused by the keyboard and the browser knows that it must be activated by the space bar or the enter key or your digit or whatever mechanism. It just happens. HTML, therefore, is fault tolerance. If you use the blink tag, which is a part of HTML, in Internet Explorer, it does not blink, which is good, because it is optional. But the words are still displayed. The content is displayed, even if the browser doesn't know the tag. And this is a superpower. So therefore, it can be backwards compatible. When HTML5 invented the video element, you could put stuff in the middle. And if the browser didn't understand the video element, it would still show the content in the middle. Therefore, it would say, I can't play the video, but download it onto your desktop and use your uh, OS's media player. Nobody got a worse experience, and people with modern browsers got a better experience. This fault tolerance is what allows the web to get better while still allowing us to watch, look at websites from yesteryear. Therefore, we can pave a cow path. When we develop the picture element, we just reuse that pattern and this says, if you understand the picture element and if you understand the WebP format, show the WebP image because it's 30% smaller than the JPEG. If you understand the picture element but you don't understand the WebP element, show the JPEG. And if you don't understand the picture tag because you're IE8, then just show the content, which is that JPEG. Nobody gets a worse experience, and this fault tolerance is what the ma makes the web backwards and forwards compatible. So I showed you the first ever website in a modern browser. This is my personal website, which is only a word. Second heavy defeat on her Brexit deal, in leading the first to further ever confusion. Browser. It's not gorgeous. It doesn't know anything about um, Unicode. And it doesn't show the pictures of me, 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 which is a terrible omission. But all the content is displayed. So the first ever website in a modern browser and the, fir and the modern website in the first ever browser still work. The content is displayed. HTML is interoperable. Here, I'm opening a B, I'm opening an I but I'm closing the B before the I, it's this nested. 
In, before HTML5, Safari and IE had a different DOM from Chrome and Firefox. And nobody was wrong and nobody was right because the spec didn't say what to do with misnested invalid code. Everybody here, I can see, has never uh, had misnested code or failed a validation. But there are losers at your workplace who often do, right? In HTML5, every browser will produce the same DOM from any conceivable permutation of markup, whether it is valid or invalid, out of the box. This is called the HTML5 parsing algorithm. And I always think of it as like a ninja of HTML. It's super powerful, but nobody ever sees it. But it's the thing that has given us the interoperability that I think has saved the web of recent years. By contrast, JavaScript is not declarative. You have to tell it how to do stuff. You can't just summon something up and it works. You have to tell it how to do it. This is really powerful, but it is not fault tolerant. Therefore, the th if you do things in JavaScript that you could do in HTML, you are deliberately choosing not to have that fault tolerance. You are deliberately choosing to make your sites less robust. Uncle, Sir Uncle Timbo said, the principle of least power. The choice of language is a common design choice. The low power end of the scale is simpler to design, implement, and use, but the high power end of the scale has all the attraction of being an open-ended hook into which anything can be placed. And Sir Uncle Timbo suggests, and this is one of the design principles behind the original web, was you should always use the least powerful tool to do the job. If you can do it in HTML, do it in HTML. If you can do it in CSS, do it in CSS. If you can't do it in HTML and CSS, yeah, use JavaScript. But only use it when you can't use a more simple choice. Use the right tool for the right job. 13 million requests for JavaScript will time out. This was Ian Feather uh, at a conference. BuzzFeed's monitoring tells him 1% of requests for JavaScript on BuzzFeed timeout. That's 13 million requests a month. And BuzzFeed isn't something that's consumed particularly in sub-Saharan Africa or Bangladesh or Nepal. This is very much a Western-oriented uh, website. But very few people surf with JavaScript turned off. Charlie Owen, hi. But everybody, at some point, does not have JavaScript. My chum, Stuart Langridge, uh, has a web page called Everyone Has JavaScript, right? And basically, no. There are times in everybody's surfing life, whether maybe you're on the tube, maybe you've gone through a tunnel, when your JavaScript just isn't working. HTML gives us these. It gives us freebies. Oh, yeah, I'm here all day. Tip your server. HTML gives us... <laughs> Don't shake your head at me, Sally Late. We've all seen this, uh, except you can't see it because the screen's cut off, but this is a radio button. It says, check if you don't want to not opt out of cancelling or stopping sending you spam forever. This demo isn't going to work because the screen's cut out, but one of them, the top one, is made properly. And therefore, you can click anywhere. No, no, the bottom one is the good one. The top one, you can click in the label, nothing happens. The bottom one, if you click in the label, it fills in the checkbox, giving you a much bigger hit area. This is really useful if, like me, you have MS and your fine motor control isn't good. It's really useful if you have fat, stubby little fingers and a small phone screen and you're going over lots of bumps on the train. It's just really useful. And if you don't need it, you don't use it and nobody gets hurt. The difference is the top one just as an input, and then some spam with the click if you don't want to not, not opt out. The bottom one is a label surrounding the input, and that gives you this greater hit area. It's really trivial to do, and I see it not done hundreds of times. Why? The reason this is important is for people who use assistive technologies, your app, your website, 
talks to the browser, which constructs an accessibility tree. And, the, and that is mapped to operating system controls. So if you have a button, your browser makes an accessibility tree, and your operating system says, I know what a button is, because I have some of those. And therefore, when it's the screen reader's hooked in, it knows what to do. If you just make a button out of divs, the accessibility tree doesn't have that button in it. And you have to patch that. But built-in beats bolt-on bigly. This is not a button. Because you have to remember to set an ARIA role, either in HTML or J JavaScript. You have to remember to manage focusability by arsing around with the tab index. You have to remember to listen for the correct key presses, which might differ between operating systems. Or you could just use an HTML button. We've all seen this. This is everybody's website. There's a header, there's your nav, there's your footer. Down here in tiny little letters is the a link for accessibility so that nobody ever finds it. Uh, this could be anything. This could be um, YouTube videos. It could be gold sovereign rings on the Argos website. Hayden. This could be uh, Guardian articles. It could be anything. Before HTML5, there was no particular way to mark these up. So we all called them div. That was perfectly fine. But the div element has no special meaning at all. By spec, Authors are strongly encouraged to view the div element as an element of the last resort for when no other element is suitable. Now in HTML5, we have header, nav, main, article, footer. People still ask me, are these things useful? Yes, they are. Uh, in a survey of screen reader users last year, 25% of people said they navigate using these landmarks whenever they're present. 18 use them often, 28% use them sell, uh, sometimes. Only 13% of assistive technology users never use these things. So if you put header, nav, footer, main in your markup, you're helping 60 odd percent of users who use screen readers. And it is entirely invisible and transparent to everybody else. You have nothing to lose. NAV is no harder to type than DIV. And are they useful? Yes. If the sound works, you will now hear Leonie Watson, uh, who is a web developer who went blind in her 20s and a screen reader user, navigating around my website, not because it's like the best of in breed, but I'm willing to put my money where my mouth is and, and find out where I've got mistakes. And this is her talking about how she goes to a website she's never been before and exploring it using HTML landmark moles, roles. Fingers crossed for sound.
Another yeah, 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 whatever. Um, <laughs> but you can see, this gives genuine help to a real person. This is a real human being consuming your semantic markup and it helping her. Why wouldn't you do that? Nobody in this room is evil. Do it. Also, it can give you some money. It can make your site have better search engine stuff. <clears throat> People like me have been banging on for ages saying that properly structured data gives you better results in the search engines. But in April, uh, yeah, in April, Google actually published some numbers. So by using structured data, Eventbrite saw a 100% increase in year-on-year -year growth, 115% in organic traffic. I don't know what the hell this stuff means, but it sounds impressive. Uh, and it gives you money. So what I do, what I've done on my website, is I'm using HTML5 microdata. I have an article, and I say it's uh, blog posting. On schema.org, there are different vocabularies for everything from medical supplies to blog posts to sports results to recipes. Uh, just choose the one that's more appropriate for your type of content. I'm saying that H2, it's got the property of a headline. The time, it's got the property of date created, date published, and pub date. Uh, pub date and date published are the same thing, but everybody else uses date published and Apple uses pub date because Apple. Um, this just works. What's great about this is if you're using the new iWatch or whatever it's called, they, they say if you mark things up with an article element, it applies this default display. And if you use item prop title, author, subheading, pub date, it will display it in a way that fits the watch well. If you use figure, image, and fig caption, it has a default display. And of course, if you use the HTML5 input types, it gives you a much better UI. Now, I know what you're saying. You're saying, Bruce, you are neither beautiful nor glamorous. How did you get early access to the, IO, uh, the watch OS beta? Well, I didn't. I did that markup eight years ago, before I even imagined that you would have websites on a watch. But because I was using semantic data, a device that I'd never even conceived of on, on a browser that had not yet been invented just works. I'm future-proofing it. Accessibility is part of usability. Um, we, again, we've been banging on about this for ages, but Messrs. Schmutz, Sonderegger, and Sauer ran a study. They got people who do not have disabilities to use websites of very low accessibility, moderate accessibility and very good accessibility. So these are people for whom accessibility is not uh, a vital factor using accessible websites. And they found that 61 participants without disabilities use one of three websites. A high level of web accessibility led to better performance than low or very low accessibility. Likewise, high web accessibility improved user ratings, perceived usability, aesthetics, workload, and trustworthiness compared with very low accessibility. And you can trust this because these people are at a university, somewhere called Switzerland, which I believe is near Germany. Um, there's a PDF if you want it. Jamie Knight, many of you might know him, he comes to these meetups sometimes. He is an autistic uh, researcher at the BBC. He said something very profound, which I've only seen reported on Twitter, but he said, no one comes to our sites disabled, they come with impairments. We disable them. Take that home in your head. Also take this home in your head, where the fluffy bunny of, mar of semantic markup goes, the Tweety Bird of Accessibility follows along. Oh, everybody say, oh. They were fucking delicious as well. <laughs> now, now it's time for a little bit of a tangent. Or as, uh, as DJs say, uh, a really shit segue. Um, I have a confession to make to you. Um, 
and I won't be, you know, I won't be angry if any of you get up and walk out at my confession. It'll be fine, uh, true confession. But folks, maybe actually I'm going to be impertinent and say to friends, this is not my natural hair colour. <laughs> oh, thank you for your support and understanding, everybody. No, this is not my natural hair colour. Uh, that kind of is, actually isn't. That's when I was uh, 18 and into the Jesus and Mary chain. Uh, my hair colour is like this because I was incredibly, uh, incredibly influenced by punk rock. Um, that DIY musical aesthetic, I really think, actually informed my appreciation of the DIY aesthetic of the early web. Just view source, muck about, see what happens. Uh, I think, actually, I've passed on that punk aesthetic to my daughter. Uh, so it's a generational thing. And I was, I was particularly influenced by a band called the Sex Pistols. Um, I can see that many of you are young'uns here, might not know them. And there might even be some people who were not punks, but maybe even were into mod or heavy rock. So here's a little taster uh, of the musical genre I mean. That's um, from the Sex Pistols' first album. <laughs> Never mind the shiny, here's the web standards. Uh, they only made one album, and they made actually very little money out of it, as most bands do with their first album. So when they reformed in 1996, after years of saying they would never reform, Everybody went, yeah, yeah, you're only doing it for the money. And they said, yeah, we're only doing it for the money. In fact, they called the tour the Filthy Lucre Tour. And I had no problem with them reforming for the money because they'd done so much to change modern music. Their content had been so profound and productive, maybe not for everybody, but for a group of people. You're looking at your watch, am I out of time? Oh, cool, cool. So I thought, OK, people who make content should be rewarded for that. So here's a little tangent in my talk of how to make loveliness, no, how to make Luca. Years ago, this is from 2006 apparently according to the Wayback Machine, I had ads on my site <coughs> um, because <coughs> in the old days hosting was actually more expensive than it is now and I was earning um, 20,000 pounds a year and I had two small kids and my hosting bills for my blog were quite a chunk out of my income. Um, because I'm an arrogant bastard who believes everybody should listen to me, I was willing to pay for you guys to listen to what I'm saying. But it was expensive, so I had these ads. <clears throat> and all that happened was they were, uh, I picked them up for, in PHP from an external site. I could tell the external site, I don't want gambling, I don't want tobacco, I don't want you know, nuclear bombs, as if people advertise nuclear bombs. And they would put these ads into a PHP file, I would put them on my site, and all that would happen is there was a, a question mark with my URL to tell the destination where it had come from. And I didn't find this to be evil. There was not tracking, there was no shenanigans, they didn't follow you around the web. It just paid my hosting bills. But, of course, advertising became ever more insidious. These days, this is the average website. Uh, the actual content you want is divided up into millions of pages, and you click through endlessly just to read the whole story. Only one of these ads is, in fact, genuine. This one really works. See me later if you want to know about it. Um, <clears throat> so by the time I was working at Opera and we were the first major browser to release browsers with an ad blocker built in, I felt entirely comfortable blocking ads because of this. Because people running ads were helping to contribute to two big behemoth ad companies' surveillance, following, around, following you around the web, building up profiles of you. Uh, which we all know allegedly helped to enable fascism in the UK 
and the US. Ads had changed very much from those little ads I had in my site from 2006 to this you see today. So I was entirely comfortable defending our building in an ad blocker into the browser. But I did get letters from people saying, you know, I have a little games review site. I'm in Poland, and the $1,000 a month I got from advertising was my living. And you guys are trying to deny me that. And I felt quite bad about this. And I remember thinking, wouldn't it be great if people who make content could get paid for doing that without having to rely on ads? And a couple of months ago, some people from a company called Coil came to me and said, would you like to help us um, develop a new web standard that will allow money to be streamed in the browser between viewer and content creator without ads? And I said, that sounds pretty cool. And so that's why later on I'm flying out to Japan today to try and persuade the browser people at W3C TPAC to put this into browsers. But basically, it works like this. And, and OK, this is Coil as a company who's sponsoring this to be made in a web standard because they want it to be an open ecosystem. You sign up for a wallet. It doesn't have to be with any particular company. Uh, it could be Stronghold for USD. It could be XRP Tipbox. It could be uh, a Euro wallet. It doesn't matter. It's a third party. They give you a payment pointer, which is like a URL, but has a dollar at the front to show you that it's a payment pointer. You put that into a meta tag in your head. Meta, name equals monetization, value equals your payment pointer. And then anybody who comes to your website with a monetized browser streams you money in nano dollars. It's tiny amounts of money from individuals going to your bank while they're watching in real time. The monetized browsers, at the moment, it's not built into the web. But there's a plugin for Chromium, a plugin for Firefox. And there's a browser called Puma, which is on iOS and coming soon in Android, which is a fork of Firefox with Mozilla's blessing. It's not a fork of Chromium, because there's enough Chromium in the world already. It's a fork of Firefox. Anybody going with those browsers sends money to your payment pointer. Um, Chris Coyer, for example, uses it to turn off ads if you, have, um, if you go to CSS Tricks with a monetized web browser. Remy Sharp is experimenting with different things. I just take your money um, and don't give you anything special. These people are experimenting with games, so they can see how much money you send them, but they only see that you have a monetized browser. They don't know who it is. They don't know it's you but they can see that they're getting money from this browser. And the money that you're sending them gets uh, transferred into in-game currency. So for example, in Flood Escape, if you come with a web monetized browser, you get 100 extra coins. Chris Coyer turns off ads on CSS Tricks. There's lots of different permutations. I know what you're thinking. Is this blockchain? No, it is not blockchain. blockchain is a really clever technology. It's entirely coincidental. It is an anagram of ha, click knob. That's entirely coincidental. There's no blockchain involved in the web monetization spec at all. It uses something called Interledger, which is developed in a community group with the W3C. It's based upon TCP IP because you can route packets of data around the web. This is routing nano dollars around the web. And it's designed purely to interoperate between different uh, kinds of ledgers. They, the ledgers might be blockchain, they may not be. But Interledger just routes between them, much like TCP IP. To date, they have sent 10 billion micropayments, because this thing's in production now. It powers something called Moja Loop, which is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And what it does is it joins up different banking uh, systems in Africa to allow money to be transferred. Because particularly in Africa, the cost of transferring money is vast. I was reading something about a guy called Frederick in Dar es Salaam. Uh, he rented out his house on Airbnb. Airbnb sent him $29. He received $9 five days later. The rest went in banking transaction fees. 
So anything we can do to get to lower the cost of transferring money is useful to us as content creators, but it's useful to everybody around the world, particularly in places where banking fees are gigantic. That 10 billion micropayments comes to $306,000 because they are genuinely micropayments. And you can't do this with credit cards where it's a, 90, it's a 15 cents flat fee plus 3%. So sending a thousandth of a dollar but paying 15 cents to do it is obviously defeating the purpose. Basically, credit cards and the current banking system is like using a fax. Interledger is like using the web, where we can send packets of data for free. Yesterday, I was reading this from a publisher. 2020 will be another year of change for digital publishers. Publishers will continue to thrive if they embrace industry changes and develop new differentiated sources of revenue. So that's why I'm going to Japan to try and add this into browsers. As Sir Uncle Timbo said, the web is for everyone and collectively we hold the power to change it. It won't be easy, but if we dream a little and work a lot, we can get the web we want. What can you do? You can learn the semantics of HTML. There are 120-ish elements. That's all. To put that into perspective, most two-year-old children can say 100 words. By the time a child is three, two and a half, she'll probably know closer to 300 words. There are 120 words in HTML. Be better than this. What else can you do? Run automated tests and go for the low-hanging fruit. Uh, I do this on my website, and I noticed it told me that I had inadequate contrast in my uh, visited links. I didn't know this, but I ran the test. I changed one line of CSS and fixed it. The web aim, the top million pages, 80% of the top million home pages fail on this simple, simple problem. And uh, Laura Calvag is going to be talking about this in more depth later. This is the test. Ada, Ada Cannon, Lady Ada King, made this wonderful little bookmarklet that will just go through your page and highlight the areas where there's inadequate contrast, open up dev tools, muck about with the CSS values until it's right to save it. You can use HTML and CSS wherever possible. Make sites that work without JavaScript and then enhance it. And choose your libraries carefully. There's loads of libraries out there. 10 on, doc, 10 on UI is a React component library that has been tested with people with disabilities, not just blind people, people with all kinds of disabilities. If you use this, it's guaranteed to be accessible, and it's free. Or you can use something like React Bootstrap, whose nav component doesn't even use a nav element. And we've seen that this has practical and tangible advantages for people with disabilities. What no nav? Bruce rejected. And don't do this. Don't smother your websites with JavaScript for no reason. As Big Al said of Google, that's Alex Russell, uh, sinister mastermind at Google, we are seeing ever more JavaScript vomited down the wire, even on mobile. And Big Al said, we cannot continue to use as much JavaScript as is the new normal and expect the web to flourish. To get this fixed, we need to confront the developer experience bait and switch. Tools that cost the poorest users to pay wealthy developers are bunk. If you're using something just because it makes your developer experience better, but is putting more stuff down the wire for the end users, you are taxing poor people to pay you. And that is discourteous. In Germany, it takes one hour of work at average wage to afford entry-level broadband. In Brazil, it takes 34 and a half hours of work to afford 500 uh, megabytes of mobile bandwidth a month. So if you're vomiting down 80K, 80 meg of Bootstrap or React or Angular, just because you can't be asked to write proper HTML, you're making somebody in Brazil work harder, and they will come round to your house and tell you off. 
In Nigeria, the data needed to watch just two minutes of online video a day can cost more than sending a child to school for a month. Yes, I know that that auto-playing video of the ping-pong tables and bean bags in your corporate office is absolutely fascinating, but it is not better than sending a child to school. I guarantee. The average React app will never load faster than 1.1 seconds on the average phone in India. The average Angular app will always take at least 2.7 seconds to boot up. The 1.1 billion people in the world are like us with high-speed internet. There are 7 billion people within mobile coverage in the world. There are 5.2 billion mobile phones. <coughs> so there are 4 billion people yet to come online. By the year 2100, the UN says 50% of the world will live in these 10 countries, only one of which is in the developed world. Developing countries are home to 94% of the global offline population. The World Bank says making the internet universally affordable is a global priority. Because the internet isn't just for us to say lol at your makes cat picture or say you suck to somebody you didn't like at school. For many, many people in sub-Saharan Africa, where they have to walk miles to see a doctor, a feature phone and a free PDF of where there is no doctor translated into their local language is first-line medical care. For many people in the world, affording school textbooks is completely impossible. But a feature phone and worldreader.org brings hundreds of thousands of people tens of thousands of textbooks in their own language for free. And there are people in the world who live in horrible despotic regimes where having the wrong opinion or having the wrong religion or being in love with the wrong gender can get you into terrible trouble or worse. But those people, access to the internet is their lifeline to a freer world. As Whale Gonhim, an Egyptian internet activist, said, if you want to liberate a country, give them the internet. And if my hippie bullshit isn't uh, convincing you, I have some numbers. McKinsey Global Institute, a sort of sinister organization, said an increase in internet maturity similar to the one that we have experienced in the last five years creates an increase in real gross domestic product per capita, per person, of 500 US dollars on average during that period. To put that into perspective, it took 50 years for the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century to achieve the same results. You too can be an HTML superhero. You don't have to own this dressing gown or those pants. All you have to do is use the web correctly. Because the web is not computers, the web is not clouds. The web is these women in Africa. It's this blind chap in Toronto. It's these women I met in a bus in Bangladesh. It's this lady in a wheelchair in Taipei. It's this farmer and his granddaughter I photographed in Cambodia. It's this chap on the metro in New York. It is for everyone. Think of your time. Sorry, I went on. Good luck.